Hello and welcome everyone to a deep dive into the Weird Wars Iceberg. We are starting off with the first layer here, and with each new video, we will go deeper, with more strange wars and conflicts that you may never have heard of. If you want me to continue, don't forget to comment down below and go ahead and like and subscribe. The Soccer War In the late 1960s, tensions between El Salvador and Honduras were already reaching a boiling point. These neighboring nations, both nestled in Central America, shared a long history of economic disparity and political strife. Honduras was a significantly larger landmass, was sparsely populated, while El Salvador was overcrowded, leading to a widespread poverty and a desperate search for resources. Thousands of Salvadorians had crossed the border into Honduras, seeking farmland and opportunity. But this migration had become a source of resentment among Honduran nationals. It was a clash of survival and identity. Compounding the tension was land reform, or the lack of it. In Honduras, land ownership was concentrated in the hands of a few wealthy elites, leaving little room for Salvadorian immigrants to integrate peacefully. Political factions on both sides amplified these problems, with populist rhetoric painting the other country as a threat to national sovereignty. Football, which was already the most popular sport in both countries, became a battleground for national pride. When the two nations faced each other in the 1970 FIFA World Cup qualifiers, it was more than just a game. It was a stage where years of frustration and anger and unresolved conflict came to light. The match was destined to ignite something far bigger than the sport. In June 1969, the World Cup qualifying matches between El Salvador and Honduras became a microcosm of the deep-seated tensions between the two nations. The rivalry was more than just athletic. It was a surrogate battlefield for national identity and pride. The three-game series began in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, where the atmosphere was anything but cordial. The night before the game, Honduras fans surrounded the Salvadorian team's hotel, banging on the drums, honking horns, and setting off fireworks to keep the players awake. It was psychological warfare. The first match ended in a narrow victory for Honduras, with a final score of 1-0. Emotions ran high, but the Salvadorians were determined to even the score when the second game moved to San Salvador. There, the roles reversed. Salvadorian fans subjected the Honduran team to similar treatment, only this time, it escalated further. Reports of physical threats and verbal abuse filled the air as the Salvadorians claimed an emphatic 3-0 victory. The series was tied, setting the stage for a high-stakes playoff on the neutral ground in Mexico City. By this time, the animosity between the two nations had reached fever pitch. Media outlets in both countries added fuel to the fire, publishing inflammatory headlines that stoked nationalist fever. Fans began to view each other as enemies, not just rivals. When El Salvador narrowly clinched the victory in the playoff, the result was not celebration, but chaos. Violence erupted in both countries, with mobs targeting immigrants and football fans from the opposing side. What began as a game, it turned into a crisis, leaving governments on edge and citizens at risk. The matches were over, but the damage had been done. What followed would etch this conflict into history as the football war. On July 14, 1969, just weeks after the final football match, El Salvador launched a military offensive against Honduras. The Salvadorian Air Force bombed Honduran targets, including airports, communication hubs, and transportation networks. This marked the official beginning of what would be known as the Football War. While the attack seemed sudden, it was a culmination of years of tension and escalating hostility. The international community watched in shock as two nations, ostensibly driven by a football rivalry, descended into open conflict. The Salvadorian government justified its actions by citing the escalating violence against Salvadorian immigrants in Honduras. In the months leading up to the war, reports of forced evictions, physical attacks, and deportation had surged, leaving thousands of Salvadorian families homeless and stranded at the border. These atrocities became a rallying cry for Salvadorian leaders, who framed their military action as a necessary defense of their citizens. However, beneath this justification lay deeper motives, territorial disputes, political posturing, and the need to distract from domestic issues. In the first 24 hours, Salvadorian forces made significant gains, capturing several border towns and advancing towards strategic targets. Honduras, though initially caught off guard, quickly mobilized a smaller but resilient military. The ensuring battles were fierce, with both sides relying on outdated weaponry and makeshift tactics. Border towns like Nuevo Ocotepeque and Chalantenango became epicenters of intense conflict. Where civilians were often caught in the crossfire. Families fled their homes, 
leaving everything behind as artillery shells destroyed villages and farmland. The air war added another layer of devastation. Both countries deployed small fleets of aircraft, many of them modified civilian planes. These aerial attacks caused extensive damage to the infrastructure and further terrorized the civilian population. Food shortages, overcrowded refugee camps, and other chaos of displacement turned the conflict into a humanitarian nightmare. As the fighting dragged on, international organizations, including the Organization of American States, or OAS, scrambled to intervene. Diplomatic pressure mounted as neighboring countries urged El Salvador and Honduras to cease hostilities. After four days of intense combat, a ceasefire was broken on July 18th, ending the war. However, the damage had been done. Over 2,000 people had lost their lives, tens of thousands were displaced, and relations between the two countries were more strained than ever. The Salvadorian troops withdrew under international pressure, but the border remained a site of tension for years to come. For the Salvadorian immigrants in Honduras, the war only worsened their plight. Many were deported, leaving behind everything they had built. Families were shattered, and their stories became emblematic of the deep human cost of the conflict. The refugee crisis put immense pressure on El Salvador, a country already struggling with poverty and overpopulation. Diplomatically, the war left a bitter legacy. The two nations severed ties for more than a decade, and regional tensions remained high. Trade routes were disrupted, and the already fragile economies of both nations suffered considerably. The Organization of American States mediated a peace agreement, but it was a tenuous truce. Underneath the surface, unresolved disputes festered. The Pig War The year was 1859. The Pacific Northwest was a frontier of contested sovereignty. At the heart of the dispute was San Juan Island, a small but strategically located piece of land between Vancouver Island and the mainland United States. The ambiguity of the Oregon Treaty of 1846 left the island's ownership unclear. The treaty stated that the border went through the channel separating Vancouver Island and the mainland, but didn't specify what channel, Harrow Strait or Rosario Strait, leaving the San Juan Island in limbo. By the mid-19th century, settlers from both the United States and Great Britain had moved onto the island. American settlers, seeking opportunity in fertile land, established farms while the Hudson's Bay Company set up operations for British interests. Though the two groups coexisted uneasily, the lack of governance created an environment ripe for conflict. The island's fertile fields and calm waters masked the tension beneath the surface. Both nations viewed control of the island as a point of national pride. By 1859, the stage was set for a seemingly trivial event to ignite a crisis that could spiral into war. On June 15th, 1859, a seemingly mundane incident shattered the fragile peace. Charles Griffin, an employee of the Hudson's Bay Company, allowed his pigs to roam freely across the island. One of these pigs wandered onto the farm of an American settler, Lyman Cutler, and began rooting in his potato patch. Frustrated by the repeating trespassing, Cutler grabbed his rifle and shot the pig. What might have been a simple property dispute escalated rapidly. Griffin, Enraged at the loss of his pig, confronted Cutler, demanded $100 in compensation. Cutler refused, claiming that the pig had no right to be on his property. Tensions flared as the incident became a symbol of the broader territorial dispute. The American settlers, led by Cutler, appealed to the U.S. military officials, arguing that they needed protection against British encroachment. Meanwhile, British authorities viewed the killing as a pig's a provocation. As word spread, both governments began to take notice. What started as a simple spat over a pig quickly turned into a diplomatic crisis. The first significant escalation came from the American side. General William S. Harney, known for his aggressive stance, ordered U.S. troops to occupy San Juan Island. Captain George Pickett, a future Confederate general, led the contingent. Upon arrival, Pickett boldly declared the entire island belonged to the United States and began fortifying the position. The British were quick to respond. Rear Admiral Robert L. Baines dispatched three warships to the island, positioning them off its coast. By mid-August, five British warships patrolled the waters, carrying over 2,000 Royal Marines. Meanwhile, the U.S. had reinforced its position with more troops. 
bringing the total American presence to nearly 500 soldiers, supported by artillery. Despite the buildup, neither side wanted to be the first to fire. Both nations understood the broader implications of open conflict. A war between Britain and the United States would have far-reaching consequences, disrupting trade and alliances on both sides of the Atlantic. On the ground, soldiers from both sides experienced an odd mixture of tension and camaraderie. British and American troops often fraternized, sharing food and drink, even as their commanders for perfect battle. The absurdity of the situation wasn't lost on those involved. One British officer famously quipped that it was a war where the only casualty was a pig. As the standoff dragged on, both nations faced increasing pressure to find a resolution. President James Buchanan, aware of the risk of escalation, urged caution. British officials, equally unwilling to provoke a larger conflict, opened channels for negotiation. The matter required careful diplomacy, as neither nation wanted to appear weak. By 1859 in November, cooler heads had prevailed. Both sides agreed to a temporary joint occupation of San Juan Island. Under the agreement, the island was divided into two camps, the American camp in the south and the British camp in the north. Troops from both nations coexisted peacefully, maintaining their respective claims while awaiting a permanent resolution. The joint occupation created a peculiar dynamic on the island. Soldiers from both sides often visited each other's camps for social events, including cricket matches and baseball games. Despite the underlying tension, the camps became a symbol of cooperation. For the next 12 years, the island remained under the shared agreement, with neither side pushing for outright control. In 1871, the matter of San Juan Island's ownership was finally referred to an international arbitration. Kaiser Wilhelm I of Germany was chosen as a neutral arbiter, tasked with resolving the dispute. After careful consideration of the treaty's language and the arguments presented by both sides, the Kaiser ruled in the favor of the United States. The decision placed San Juan Island firmly under American control, drawing the boundary through Hyrule Strait. British officials accepted the ruling, bringing an end to the long-standing territorial dispute. On November 25, 1872, the British withdrew their remaining forces from the island, and the matter was formally resolved. The Barbary Wars In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the fledgling United States found itself navigating treacherous international waters literally and figuratively. Having won independence from Britain, the nation was eager to establish trade routes and secure its place in global commerce. However, the Mediterranean Sea, vital for trade with Europe and the Middle East, was dominated by the Barbary states of North Africa, Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli. These states, under Ottoman suzerainty but largely independent, relied heavily on piracy as a source of income. For decades, European nations have dealt with the Barbary Corsairs by paying tributes to ensure the safe passage of their ships. Under British protection, American merchant vessels had enjoyed similar immunity, but after independence, American ships became fair game. Barbary pirates seized U.S. vessels, enslaving their crews and demanding exorbitant ransoms. By the late 1790s, piracy posed a severe threat to American commerce. In response, Congress authorized payments of tribute to the Barbary states, a move that divided public opinion. While some viewed it as a necessary evil, others, including future President Thomas Jefferson, vehemently opposed it. Jefferson believed that paying tribute only emboldened the Barbary rulers, and that the only solution would challenge them militarily. His conviction would soon be tested. In 1801, tensions reached a breaking point. The Pasha of Tripoli, Yusuf Karamanali, demanded a steep increase in the tribute from the United States. When Jefferson refused, the Pasha declared war on the United States by symbolically cutting down the flagstaff outside the U.S. consulate. Jefferson, not president, seized the opportunity to put his anti-tribute philosophy into action. The U.S. Navy, though still in its infancy, was dispatched to the Mediterranean under Commodore Richard Dale. The goal was clear, protect American commerce and pressure Tripoli into negotiations. Early efforts focused on blockading Tripoli's ports. While this strategy disrupted the Pasha's operation, it did not achieve decisive results. A significant moment in the war came in 1803, when the USS Philadelphia, under Captain William Brainridge, ran aground near Tripoli and was captured by the Barbary forces. The crew was imprisoned, and the ship was repurposed by the Tripolitans. This was a humiliating blow to the US, but it set the stage for one of the most daring naval operations in American history. 
In 1804, Lieutenant Stephen Decatur led a covert mission to destroy the Philadelphia. Disguised as Walty's trading vessel, Decatur and his men infiltrated Tripoli's harbor, boarded the captured frigate, and set it ablaze. The mission was a resounding success, earning Decatur national fame and praise from British Admiral Lord Nelson, who called it the most bold and daring act of the age. Meanwhile, a parallel effort unfolded on land. William E., a former U.S. consul to Tunis, devised a plan to overthrow Yusuf Kamramanili by supporting his exiled brother, Ahmet. Eden led a small force of U.S. Marines and mercenaries on a grueling overland march from Egypt to the city of Derna, a stronghold of Tripoli. By 1805, Eden's forces had captured Derna, marking the first time that the U.S. flag was raised in victory on foreign soil. This victory pressured the Pasha into negotiations. The First Barbary War ended with a treaty in 1805. While the U.S. agreed to pay a ransom for the release of American prisoners, this treaty significantly reduced tribute demands. Though it was not a complete triumph, the war established the United States' willingness to defend its interests abroad. The peace achieved in 1805 was short-lived. While Tripoli and Tunis abided largely by the treaty, Algiers resumed its predatory practices, emboldened by the War of 1812. With the U.S. Navy preoccupied with Britain, Algerian corsairs seized American ships and enslaved their crews. By the war's end, it was clear that the tribute system remained a thorn in the side of American trade. In 1815, with the War of 1812 concluded, the United States turned its attention back to the Mediterranean. President James Madison, determined to end the Barbary threat once and for all, authorized a second campaign against the North African states. This time, the U.S. Navy was larger, battle-hardened, and better prepared. The Second Barbary War began in 1805, when Commodore Stephen Decatur, now a seasoned naval veteran, led a squadron of ten ships to the Mediterranean. His orders were clear. Subdue the Barbary states and eliminate tribute demands permanently. Decatur's campaign began with swift victories. Off the coast of Spain, the squadron captured the flagship of the Algerian navy, forcing the Day of Algiers into humiliating negotiation. Decatur demanded and secured the release of all American prisoners without ransom, the renunciation of future tribute demands, and compensation for previous seizures. This treaty marked a turning point, as it signaled the end of America's acquiescence to piracy. Decatur then turned his attention to Tunis and Tripoli, delivering similar ultimatums. Both states, aware of Decatur's successes in Algiers, quickly capitulated. By the end of 1815, the Barbary states had agreed to treaties that abolished tribute payments and secured safe passage for American ships. The Emu War In the aftermath of World War I, Australia faced a crisis of reintegration for its returning soldiers. Thousands of veterans were given land in Western Australia under the government soldier settlement scheme. The idea was to convert these soldiers into farmers, turning the vast, untamed lands into productive wheat fields. However, by the late 1920s, these farms were struggling. Falling wheat prices during the Great Depression left many farmers financially devastated, and the promised government subsidies failed to materialize. Adding to the farmers' woes, an unexpected enemy emerged. Emus. These large, flightless birds, native to Australia, migrated in massive numbers from the arid interior to the fertile farmlands of the Western Australia. Drawn by their promise of food and water, tens of thousands of emus descended on the wheat fields, trampling crops and destroying fences. For the farmers, already battling economic hardship, the emu invasion was the final straw. With their livelihoods at stake, the farmers turned to the government for help. What followed? was one of the most bizarre and ill-fated military campaigns in history. In response to the farmers' pleas for help, the Australian government agreed to deploy military resources to deal with the emu problem. The task was handed to Major G.P.W. Meredith of the Royal Australian Artillery, who was accompanied by two soldiers and equipped with two Lewis machine guns. Their mission was simple, eliminate the emus and protect the wheat fields. In October 1932, the campaign began in the Companion District of Western Australia, where emus had been decided in large numbers. The operation's logic seemed straightforward. Heavily armed soldiers would have no trouble dealing with the birds. However, the emus proved to be far more elusive and resourceful than anyone had anticipated. The first attempt to engage the emus take place on November 2nd, 1932. Major Meredith and his men set up an ambush near a waterhole, where a flock of approximately 50 emus were expected to appear. 
As the birds approached, the soldiers opened fire. Chaos ensued. The emu scattered almost immediately, running in all directions. Despite firing hundreds of rounds, the soldiers only managed to kill a few birds. The emu's ability to dodge and outrun the soldiers left Meredith's teams frustrated. Emus could sprint at the feet of up to 50 kilometers per hour, and their erratic movements made them difficult targets. What should have been a quick operation turned into a drawn-out and humiliating campaign. Over the following days, Meredith attempted several more ambushes, each with limited success. The emus had an uncanny ability to evade gunfire, and their numbers seemed endless. Even when the soldiers managed to hit their targets, the sheer resilience of the birds became a point of astonishment. Meredith later remarked that some of the emus could absorb multiple bullets, continue running as though nothing had happened. As the campaign dragged on, the emus adapted to the soldiers' tactics. They began traveling in smaller groups, making them harder to track and target. The soldiers, meanwhile, struggled with unreliable equipment and logistical challenges. The Lewis guns, designed for infantry combat, were poorly suited for the mobile warfare against fast-moving birds. Furthermore, the rugged terrain of Western Australia made it difficult for the soldiers to position themselves effectively. One particularly disastrous incident occurred when Meredith decided to mount one of the machine guns on a truck. The idea was to chase the emus and fire on them while in motion. However, the rough terrain made the aiming impossible, and the truck itself was unable to keep up with the birds. The attempt ended in failure, with no emus killed and the truck barely functional. By mid-November, after weeks of effort, the soldiers had expended around 250 rounds of ammunition, but had managed to kill only a few hundred emus. With thousands of birds still wreaking havoc on the farms, the operation was declared a failure. The soldiers withdrew, leaving the emus victorious. News of the emu war quickly spread, and the campaign became the subject of national ridicule. The idea of a modern military being outsmarted by a flock of birds was both absurd and humiliating. Critics questioned why the government had deployed soldiers for such an inclusive mission, while some saw the entire affair as a symbol of the disconnect between urban politicians and rural farmers. For the farmers, the end of the campaign brought no relief. The emu problem persisted, and crop damage continued to mount. Ultimately, the government provided some assistance in the form of bounties for individual emu kills, encouraging local hunters to take on the task. The emus, meanwhile, thrived. Their survival became a testament to their adaptability and resilience. Over time, their population stabilized, and they returned to their natural migration patterns. Though the memory of the emu war lingered, as a bizarre chapter in Australian history. The Zanzibar War By the late 19th century, Zanzibar, an island off the coast of modern-day Tunisia, was a bustling trade hub in the Indian Ocean. Known for its spices and as a center for the East African slave trade, Zanzibar held strategic importance for European powers vying for influence in Africa. Britain, which had established a protectorate over Zanzibar in the 1890s, sought to maintain control over the island to secure its interests in the region. The sultans of Zanzibar ruled under British supervision, with the understanding that they would cooperate with British policies. One of these policies included the suppression of the slave trade, which Britain had been actively combating in the region. This agreement worked relatively smoothly until 1896, when Sultan Hamad bin Blawani, a pro-British ruler, died suddenly under mysterious circumstances. His cousin, Khalid bin Barghash quickly seized the throne without British approval, setting the stage for a confrontation. The British viewed Khalid's ascension as a direct threat to their authority. Khalid, unlike his predecessor, was opposed to British influence and sought to assert Zanzibar's independence. Within hours of his takeover, British officials demanded that Khalid abdicate in favor of a more compliant ruler. Khalid refused, barricading himself in the Sultan's palace and raising his own forces. The standoff that followed would escalate into the shortest war in recorded history. Tension between Khalid and the British escalated rapidly. Khalid, supported by around 3,000 loyal fighters, fortified the palace and its surroundings. His forces included palace guards and civilian supporters armed with rifles, as well as a few outdated cannons and a royal yacht equipped with light armaments. Determined to resist British demands, Khalid prepared for a siege. The British, on the other hand, acted decisively. Rear Admiral Harry Rawson, commanding the British naval forces in the region, 
began assembling a fleet of warships in the harbor. The British also mobilized a small contingent of Marines and Zanzibari troops loyal to their preferred candidate, Hamad bin Mohammed. Boston delivered an ultimatum to the Khalid. He had until 9 a.m. on August 27, 1896, to surrender and step down. Khalid remained defiant, believing his forces could hold off the British. He ignored warnings that the British Navy's firepower vastly outmatched anything he could muster. As the deadline approached, the city of Sanzibar braced for conflict. Civilians fled the area around the palace, while the British warships positioned themselves for an assault. At precisely 9.02 a.m. on August 27, 1896, the British fleet opened fire on the Sultan's palace. The bombardment was devastating. British ships, including the HMS St. George and the HMS Thrush, unleashed a barrage of shells that quickly overwhelmed Khalid's defenses. Within minutes, the palace was engulfed in flames, and Khalid's forces began to disintegrate. The Sultan's cannons, many of which were relics from earlier eras, proved ineffective against the modern British warships. Khalid's royal yacht, the HHS Glasgow, was sunk almost immediately, further demoralizing his forces. As the shelling continued, many of Khalid's fighters fled or surrendered, unable to withstand the sheer power of the British assault. By 9.40 a.m., less than 40 minutes after the first shot was fired, the fighting was over. Khalid had abandoned the palace and sought refuge in the German consulate, leaving his supporters to defend for themselves. The British quickly secured the area, taking control of the palace and the surrounding streets. What had started as a tense standoff had ended in one of the most lopsided conflicts in history. The Anglo-Zanzibar War, lasting between 38 and 45 minutes depending on the account, remains the shortest war on record. The British suffered only one casualty, a sailor who was injured aboard one of the ships. In contrast, Khaled's forces sustained heavy losses, with over 500 killed and wounded. The destruction of the palace and the sinking of the royal yacht symbolized the totality of Khaled's defeat. After the conflict, the British quickly installed their preferred candidate, Hamoud bin Mohammed, as Sultan. Hamoud proved to be a compliant ruler, aligning Zanzibar's policies with British interests, including the further suppression of the slave trade. The island remained under British influence until its independence in the mid-20th century. Khalid's fate was less than favorable. Although he initially sought asylum at the German consulate, the British eventually pressured the Germans to hand them over. He fled in Sanzibar aboard a German ship, avoiding capture. Khalid spent much of his later life in exile, living in German East Africa, which is now modern-day Tanzania, before being captured by British forces during World War I. For the people of Zanzibar, the war marked a turning point. It solidified British control over the island and ended any serious challenge to their authority. The destruction caused by the conflict, though brief, served as a stark reminder of the consequences of defying overwhelming imperial power. The War of the Bucket The War of the Bucket, or the War of the Oaken Bucket, took place in 1325 between two rival Italian city-states, Modena and Bologna. At first glance, the conflict seems absurd, centered around the theft of a wooden bucket. However, the rivalry between these two cities had deep historical and political roots that extended far beyond this peculiar trigger. During the 14th century, much of northern Italy was divided between two factions, the Guelphs and the Goblinas. The Guelphs supported the papacy, while the Goblinas aligned themselves with the Holy Roman Emperor. This ideological divide turned northern Italy into a patchwork of feuding city-states, each vying for power and influence. Bologna was a staunch Guelph city, fiercely loyal to the Pope, while Modena aligned with the Goblinas. Their rivalry spanned decades, fueled by territorial disputes, economic competition, and cultural differences. By the early 1300s, tensions were running high. The theft of a bucket from the Bolognese well, allegedly by Modenese soldiers, became the flashpoint that ignited one of history's strangest wars. The wooden bucket in question was a symbol of civic pride for Bologna. According to popular accounts, Modernese soldiers raided Bologna's main well and stored the bucket as a trophy, parading it through Madonna to humiliate their rivals. While this act of provocation might seem trivial today, it was a grave insult in the fiercely competitive and honor-driven culture of medieval Italy. For Bologna, the death was not just about a bucket, it was an affront to their reputation and sovereignty. Outraged, the Bolognese leadership demanded the immediate return of the bucket and issued threats of military action if their demands were not met. 
Modena refused to comply. The refusal escalated the situation, and Bologna began to mobilize its forces. The city raised a militia of over 30,000 men, including knights, foot soldiers, and conscripts. Modena, though smaller, amassed an army of around 7,000 soldiers. Both sides were prepared to fight, not just for the bucket, but for their honor and political standing in the region. The decisive confrontation took place near the village of Zapolonio, located close to the border between Modella and Bologna. On November 15, 1325, the two armies faced off in what would become one of the largest battles fought in medieval Italy. Despite being heavily outnumbered, the Modernese forces had several advantages. Their soldiers were better trained, and their cavalry was particularly efficient. The Modernese also benefited from the tactical acumen of its commanders, who understood the terrain and used it to their advantage. The battle began with a fierce exchange of arrows and skirmishes between the two armies' forward units. The Bolognese, confident in their superior numbers, launched a full-scale assault, hoping to overwhelm the Modernese lines. However, the Modernese cavalry executed a series of devastating flanking maneuvers, cutting through the Bolognese rank and throwing their forces into disarray. As the battle progressed, the Bolognese army began to falter. Their sheer numbers became a liability, as the crowded battlefield left little room for maneuvering. The Modernese exploited this chaos, pushing their enemies back and eventually routing the Bolognese forces. By the end of the day, thousands of Bolognese soldiers lay dead or captured, while the Modernese celebrated a resounding victory. The Modernese army, emboldened by their triumph, marched straight to the gates of Bologna. Although they stopped short of capturing the city, their show of force sent a clear message. Modena would not be intimidated. To their insult to injury, the Modernese seized another wooden bucket from a well near Bologna and brought it back to their city as a second trophy. The defeat was a humiliating double to Bologna. The loss of thousands of soldiers, combined with the symbolic death of the bucket, honors the reputation among other Guelph cities. Modena, on the other hand, solidified its standing as a formidable Ghibelline power. While the War of the Bucket was shortly lived, its consequences lingered. The rivalry between Modena and Bologna persisted for centuries, fueled by the memory of the battle and the symbolic importance of the bucket. The conflict also highlighted the fragility of peace in medieval Italy, where even minor provocations could spark large-scale violence. The Battle of Castle Itter In the waning days of World War II, as Allied forces enclosed on Nazi Germany from both the east and the west, an extraordinary battle unfolded in the Austrian Alps. This unusual confrontation, known as the Battle of Castle Itter, took place on May 5, 1945, just days before Germany's surrender. It was remarkable, not only for its timing, but for the composition of forces involved. American soldiers fighting alongside defected German Wehrmacht soldiers, French prisoners, and Austrian resistance fighters against the fanatical remnants of the SS. Castle Itter a medieval fortress nestled in the Tyrol region of Austria had been converted by the Nazis into a prison for high-profile captives. Among the inmates were prominent French political and military figures, including former Prime Minister Edouard Delardier and Paul Reynaud, Generals Maurice Gamelin and Maxi Vagand, and the tennis champion Jean Botra. The prisoners, held as bargaining chips, endured months of confinement in the castle under the watchful flies of their SS guards. By early in May 1945, with Hitler dead and Berlin in ruins, the Nazi regime was collapsing. In the chaos, Castle Itter's SS guards abandoned another post, leaving the French prisoners unprotected but still in grave danger. Knowing that SS loyalists might return, but that the castle could be caught in the crossfire of advancing Allied and German forces, the prisoners sought help. The quest would lead to one of the most improbable alliances in the history of warfare. With the guards gone, the prisoners took control of the castle, but quickly realized they were vulnerable. Lacking both weapons and military experience, they needed assistance. The castle's Czech handyman, Andreas Corbo, volunteered to venture into the nearby town of Wargol to seek help from the advancing American forces. Probat made contact with Major Joseph Gengel, a Wehrmacht officer who had grown disillusioned with the Nazi regime. Gengel had already been working with the Austrian resistance fighters to minimize bloodshed in the war's final days. When he was informed of the prisoners' plight, Gengel decided to act. Knowing that the castle would require more firepower to defend, he reached out to nearby American forces. They approached Captain John C. Jack Lee Jr., 
an officer in the 23rd Tank Battalion of the U.S. Army. Though initially skeptical, Lee was intrigued by the unusual situation. Recognizing the strategic and symbolic importance of rescuing such high-profile prisoners, he agreed to lead a rescue mission. Together, this unlikely coalition of Americans, defecting Germans, and resistant fighters set off for Castle Itter. On May 5, 1945, Captain Lee's small force, comprising of a Sherman tank named Pisadam Jenny, a handful of American infantrymen, a group of Wehrmacht soldiers under Gengel's command, arrived at Castle Itter. The French prisoners, armed with the few weapons left behind by the SS guards, joined the defenders, conforming the castle into a makeshift fortress. Shortly after their arrival, the castle became under attack from a force of approximately 150 Waffen SS troops determined to recapture it. The defenders, though heavily outnumbered, had the advantage of the castle's fortified position. The battle quickly turned into a desperate siege. The Sherman tank provided critical firepower, propelling waves of SS assaults. However, as the fighting intensified, the defenders faced mounting challenges. The SS deployed machine guns and mortars, damaging the tank and inflicting casualties. Communication with Allied reinforcements was limited, leaving the defenders uncertain about whether help would arrive in time. What made the battle extraordinary was the cooperation between former enemies. German officer Josef Gengel, risking his life to oppose the Nazis, fought alongside the Americans and the French prisoners. Gengel and his men provided critical knowledge of the terrain and enemy tactics, helping to bolster the castle's defenses. The French prisoners, including generals and politicians untrained for combat, took up arms and fought valiantly. John Baroda, the tennis champion, volunteered to sneak past enemy lines to deliver a message to nearby American forces. Displaying remarkable courage, he succeeded in reaching reinforcements, ensuring that help was on its way. This unlikely alliance of soldiers, prisoners, and resistant fighters worked together seamlessly, united by a shared goal, to survive and defeat the fanatical attack of the SS. As the battle raged on, the defenders faced a dire situation. The Sherman tank was disabled, ammunition was learning low, and the SS attackers showed no signs of relenting. However, Baroda's daring mission bore fruit. Reinforcements from the 142nd Infantry Regiment of the U.S. Army, alerted by his message, began moving forward towards the castle. By the afternoon of May 5th, the sound of American artillery signaled the arrival of the reinforcements. The SS forces, caught between the castle's defenders and the advancing American troops, began to retreat. A final push by the defenders, supported by fresh American forces, drove the remaining SS soldiers from the area, bringing the battle to a close. The Battle of Castle Itter was a clear but costly victory. Several defenders, including German officer Joseph Gengel, were killed in the fighting. Gengel's sacrifice was particularly poignant. He had risked everything to stand against the Nazis and protect the prisoners. Today, he is remembered as a hero in Austria, which the street in Wurgel named in his honor. The French prisoners were liberated, and their safe return to France became a symbolic victory in the closing days of World War II. For Captain Lee and his men, the battle was a testament to the power, cooperation, and courage in the face of overwhelming odds. The Battle of Castle Itter holds a unique place in history, it's one of the few instances where American and German soldiers fought side by side. It exemplifies how common humanity can transcend even the deepest divisions in times of crisis. <laughs>